Clues in the landscape that tell me what happened here. Plopped right in the middle of a nearby neighborhood is something remarkable. This is a huge rock. I grew up in Seattle and never heard about this rock. That kind of bothers me. It's a gigantic boulder. It's got trees going around it, so it's been here a long time. It makes you ask the question, how did they get here? To understand how, you need to get the big picture. And luckily, I know a place with a spectacular view. A spot I dreamed of climbing when I was a kid. Oh yeah. The top of the Seattle Space Needle. This is fantastic. You gonna clip me in the back there? First. Okay, I'm ready to go. And belay? Okay. I'm 600 feet above the street. No place to be if you're scared of heights. But for me, it's the perfect way to check out the city's contours. Oh man, what a great place. This is really phenomenal. I never thought I'd be able to climb to the top of the Space Needle in my hometown. And you really get to understand the landscape when you view it from above. You can see things you don't see when you're at human scale. The hills have a grain to them, north to south in this case. They're all pointing in one direction, as if something powerful flowed over them. This is a landscape created by snow, accumulating year after year to form a massive moving ice sheet, big enough to shape hills and dump a huge boulder on what's now the edge of the city. Around 17,000 years ago, an ice sheet once towered 3,000 feet, five times the height of the Space Needle. Seattle was at the edge of a vast ice sheet that covered half of North America. In places, the ice was over two miles thick. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Kirk. So go ahead, Kirk. Oh man, that was so much fun climbing the Space Needle. You know, I when I was a kid, I grew up in Seattle. I the height of the Space Needle. And, uh, you know, we used to ride up to the top of the Space Needle and the top rotates around. And I always thought, what is so cool to get to the very top of it. And the thing I learned was that uh, when you're a kid, the things you wanna do always stick with you. So I'll tell you kind of what happened next. I um, grew up in Seattle and my, my dad was very much an outdoorsman. We would go to places like um, the mountains or to the, to the coastline, the beaches and look around. And so here's the town of Seattle. You can see the space needle at 600 feet tall. And here's a picture of me when I was about six years old on the Oregon coast. And we go walking on the beaches and you can see when you walk around on the landscape, there are rocks everywhere. And for a lot of people, rocks are just rocks. But I started to look at the rocks and say, you know, the rocks, some of them have fossils in them. And I'd heard about this guy who knew where to find really cool fossils. And I eventually, when I was about 12 years old, I located this guy. He worked for the highway department in Washington state. And he took me to this beach and he said, here's a, here's a hammer. And when you walk on this beach, look for the rocks that are really round. And if you look in this picture, you can kind of see some really round rocks. He said, when you get those really round rocks, you smack them as hard as you can with a hammer. And if you get really lucky, something will be inside the rock. So here's one of these rocks. In fact, this is a rock that we found that very first day when I was 12 years old. And you can see where the hammer hit it. And when the hammer cracked the rock open, it popped open like that. And right in the middle of the rock was this amazing fossil crab. And it, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, you can find amazing things from ancient worlds. Here's a fossil crab that was alive 35 million years ago. And I find him when I was 12 years old. And that's made me want to think, hey, could there be anything cooler? And then it turns out there was something cooler. A couple of years later, I found a place in Eastern Washington where there is these very flat rocks. We call them paper shale. If you split them open, they're like opening the pages of a book and you pop them open and inside are fossil plants. And what's so cool about a fossil plant is you get the top side and the bottom side and you basically get two fossils for the price of one. But what I learned was that fossil leaves like this one 
are really remarkable little things. They tell you what trees were growing in a certain place. So this is a leaf that's 50 million years old and that tree was growing on that spot 50 million years ago. But the leaves are pretty neat too because their vein patterns tell you what kind of plant they were and the leaf size tells you how much it rained and the leaf edge tells you how warm it was and you can look for insect damage on the leaves. So fossil leaves are like little fossil weather stations. So even at a young age, I was thinking, boy, fossils are a great profession. And in fact, I grew up to become a paleobotanist, the person who studies fossil plants. So you know, what, a, what an interesting way to like go from being a kid to being a scientist, but it started with a childhood curiosity. Kirk, what's one of your favorite fossils that you've found so far? Oh man, I, I have so many fossils that I found that I really love. Um, I have happened to have one of them with me right now, which is I found it in uh, 2012. We were doing an excavation in Colorado at 9,000 feet and we had found some mammoth bones, these bones of giant um, elephant-like animals. And we were digging and we found this bone. I'm gonna back up so you can see the whole thing. This is a cast of it. It's, you know, it's big though. And, and when you find a bone, the first question is what part of the body? And the second question is whose body? And I, I couldn't figure this out. I'm like, what in the world is this thing? And one of my friends said, well, uh, it looks like a humerus. That would be the upper arm bone, this, the bicep bone. And then I remembered that paleontologists say, if you find a bone you can't understand, it's probably from a giant ground sloth. And that's exactly what this is. This is a giant brown sloth upper arm bone that was living in Colorado about 120,000 years ago. And that's why I love fossils so much is you find them in random places, but they tell you really amazing stories about the Earth's past. How big is a, how big is a giant ground sloth compared to our little guys today? Like for, you know, yeah, so a little, the, today's ground sloths weigh about five or 10 pounds. And North America had four different kinds of giant ground sloths. There was the, the two of them that were about the size of grizzly bears, one that was a little bit larger than that, and one that was about the size of an elephant. So imagine a 10,000 pound sloth walking across Arizona, and you've got a different view of the world. And we find fossils of these things all over the place. Um, they've been found in Kentucky and in Alaska, and, all over the state. So these are animals that originally came across the land bridge from South America into North America a couple million years ago, and they went extinct eventually. But there are um, they're amazing fossils. And when you find them, you're like, wow, the world was a different place. Yeah, and that's kind of crazy when you think about sloths. I think, you know, in the rainforests of Costa Rica, and you're talking about finding this giant ground sloth fossil in Colorado, which couldn't have a more different, you know, more different weather and more different climate. So what are these fossils kind of telling us about our planet and how it's changed over time? Yeah, this is one of the things you realize is the planet does change all the time. The continents move, the climate changes, mountain ranges grow, they erode away. Um, and we know from geology where the continents were, when they were. So you can go back in time and make ancient worlds relocate the continents based on the geology, and then dig the fossils and populate those continents with their animals and plants. And that's really what I've done my whole career is to dig up ancient worlds and rebuild them. I usually use artists to help me paint the worlds because fossil bones are fossil bones, but that world used to have trees and animals walking around in it. And the more you do that, the more you realize that today's configuration with the icy caps and the poles and really the tropical warm part in the middle that's just today's world. Ancient mm -hmm. worlds were quite a bit different than that. There were times when there were no ice caps at all and then when there were forests on the poles, for instance. That's so interesting. So you're almost like a climate detective, right? Looking at past clues to tell us what, how our planet has changed and even what could, we, what could be in our future, right? That's right. So I'm, I could call me a deep time climate detective because I, I worry about the climate 500 million years ago and 50 million years ago, a long time in the past. But because the climate has changed in the past from very warm to very cold, um, and right now we're sort of right in the middle, mm. um, you can think, well, what's it gonna happen next? Is it, if it gets warmer, what will it be like? We can go back to an ancient warm world and look at what our future is gonna be like. So we can use the history of the planet to talk about the planet's future. It's a very powerful tool. 
Yeah, and this is one of the big things we really wanted to talk about in Polar Extremes, the film that you just worked with us on that aired in February. So tell us a little bit more, like, why did you want to tell this story? Why was this something that was really important and something that, you know, we should make available to folks? Well, let me, I'll show you, I'll tell you a little story because it, it all goes back to this experience I had when I was 23 years old. And I went to, um, I was actually at a, uh, a lecture in, in uh, California and I met a guy who gave this amazing talk and he talked about this place called Ellesmere Island. You can see on this map that Ellesmere is that big island at the very top of Canada. It's just to the left of Greenland. And it's, you know, on this map, it doesn't look that big, but that island is as big as England. It's a huge island. And there's one um, small village of people that lives in the south end of it. Otherwise, it's uninhabited. It's got polar bears. It's got white wolves. It's got musk oxen. Um, but this guy gave a talk about some research he was doing. And he was working with a woman named Mary Dawson. And here's a picture from 1984 of Mary Dawson on the left and me on the right when I was 23 years old. And Mary was a scientist who studied fossil animals. And she had this theory that if the world had been warmer in the past, you might be able to find the fossils of warm worlds up in that area of Ellesmere. And she went up there in 1977 and actually found those things. And so I joined her and we went up to Ellesmere Island. And here's a picture of a helicopter. And you can see there's a great big thick coal seam there. And in the coal seam are these crumbly white rocks coming out. And if you get close to those things, they turn out to be petrified tree stumps. It's tree stumps made into stone. And if you walked around, you actually found entire forests of these ancient petrified tree trunks. And they got really big. Here's a picture of me and the two other guys who were on the exploration standing next to a huge fossil tree trunk. But the catch is that we're more than a thousand miles north of the nearest living tree. And that always bothered me. For 30 years, that bothered me. The whole story of what would, it, what would it take to make the place that's so cold today be so warm 50 million years ago? And when Nova came to me and said, hey, what, what show do you want to do next? I said, I want to go to Ellesmere Island again. I haven't been there since I was 23 years old. I want to go back to those petrified forests and I want to tell a story of the ancient warm worlds of the high Arctic. So that's what caused the whole program to begin in the first place. And you got to go on some pretty great adventures for this project as well, from pole to pole, Patagonia, Greenland, Antarctica. So I'd love to show a clip of um, your adventure to Greenland with one of our scientists, David Holland. Fantastic. Great. They can point the tail. Yep, yep, perfect. I'm getting my camera, I think. I'm joining Denise and David Holland and their team of scientists from New York University. Hello guys, are you ready? Here yes, we go. Sir, ready. Ready. We're flying up to the edge of the massive ice sheet that covers almost all of Greenland. Oh, that's a huge iceberg yeah. down there. Now, the scale of this thing is, is amazing. The team wants to understand how the ice behaves here. Well, like if you're able to uh, drop me and then take off for a bit, that, that makes it quite a bit easier for me. Mountaineer Brian Ruji has to venture out between the crevasses to place GPS trackers at different spots on this fast-moving, treacherous glacier. Got to put it on the ground. I just need to find a spot. Lots of little crevasses here. Seems flat, but it's not flat at all. Pretty windy up here. The 45 mile per hour winds are too high for the pilot to risk touching down completely on the ice. Alec, I'm going to open the door, OK? Yep. Brian will have to make a quick exit. Uh, so we're going to deploy carefully. Take care of the rotors, OK? Yeah, Brian got the message on the rotors. We're going to circle back for him later in a few minutes, OK? I wouldn't want to be him, but I trust your judgment. The solar powered GPS instruments will measure how fast the glacier is moving. Make sure that we know where he is. The little lake is a good landmark. Yeah. Malik, do you read the Marco? Yeah, I'll read you. We are doing a circle around the uh, position. The wind is howling out there. Is he coming on board again? He's now boarding. Brian's now on board. Closing okay. door. All secure. Well done. Check. That's something. 
data from the trackers will be downloaded back at the research base on a rocky outcrop near the glacier. The team spends several weeks here each summer. Oh, this is amazing out here. It's awesome. When you come to a place like this, you're blown away by the vastness of the scale of the ice. That sounds like a pretty epic adventure. <laughs> do you, what do you think you need to be, you know, have a, a little bit of a, I don't know, a riskier side or a, a, an adrenaline seeker to be in your field? Well, you know, it's funny. I, you don't have to be by any means, but and I don't like to take unnecessary risks, but I'll tell you, I was, I've never been in a scarier place in my life than the top of the Greenland ice cap. I mean, the Space Needle was fine. I was roped in. I wasn't going to fall off a Space Needle. But that ice cap, we were landing a helicopter, and the wind was blowing 40 miles an hour, and there was water across the top of it. And then there was all those crevasses that went straight down. So you could slide, get blown by the wind, and just drop into a crevasse. And fortunately, I didn't get out of the helicopter. That was Brian, the uh, guy who put the GPS device on the thing. But just amazing, because when I showed the pictures of that animation of Seattle and the, in the Space Needle be covered by ice. It's like, yeah, right. There's that much ice. But the fact is that Greenland is a place like that today. That ice in Greenland is 2,000 to 3,000 feet thick where we were, up to 10,000 feet thick in the middle. So Greenland is what Seattle used to be like. So that's what's cool about the world today. You can go to the for the poles and see what the ice ages used to look like. You can go to the equator and see what the dinosaur time used to look like. And the modern world lets you explore ancient worlds in the same way the ancient worlds let you predict future worlds. So as being a paleontologist, you're also kind of a geographer and a time traveler. And uh, to go on top of the Greenland ice caps, amazing. That, that thing is almost 1,500 miles north to south and 500 miles east to west. It's huge. I mean, it's a huge place of two miles of ice on top of it. And most people don't even think about Greenland. I say, oh, that's the place that's got ice and Iceland's got green, but it's, it's <laughs> this amazing world we live in. And to be able to go to places like that, see them firsthand and then and ask the question, how did that ice get there? Because that's a really big question. I mean, great, there's an island called Greenland that has two miles of ice on it. How did the ice get there? And it's a simple answer. It basically, it snowed one year and then the summer came and the snow didn't melt. And then the next winter it snowed again, and the next summer came and it didn't melt. And the snow just stacked up for thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. And it compacted out of that ice. So that, that entire ice on top of Greenland is just what happens when you snow in a cold world. And the summers are so cold, the snow doesn't melt and the snow piles up. So understanding how it got there makes you really ask questions, well, are we growing glaciers right now or are we melting glaciers? And it turns out that right now we're melting glaciers. What, how, how much are the glaciers melting right now? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to measure how much they're melting, but it's possible. We use all sorts of techniques. And the guy I was visiting in Greenland was using a lot of techniques where he was measuring the water temperature in the fjord to see if it was colder than ice or warmer than ice. He was measuring how fast the ice sheet was moving. And then people use satellites to actually measure how much the ice sheet decreases in its elevation. So there's lots of ways of measuring the amount of ice that's there. And you can, like, it's just like an ice cube. You put an ice cube on your kitchen counter and watch it, it will go away. And Greenland is doing that right now. It's just that it's an extremely large ice cube. So it's probably going to take thousands of years for that ice cube to melt. But Greenland is melting. And every year, you see water pouring off and you see more icebergs coming out of it. And we are, we are slowly, slowly but surely, we're losing Greenland. Mm -hmm. And how, is, how important are ice at the poles to you know, life as we know it? So we're not at the point where you know, there are sloths in Colorado or <laughs> anything like that. So uh, what role do the ice at the poles or do the poles in general play in our current climate? If you look at our, our modern world, we have an ice cap in Antarctica, which is about 10 times as big as the one in Greenland, but you basically have ice covered poles. And what they do is they make the ends of the earth extremely frigid, whereas the middle of the earth in the tropics is quite warm. So the gradient from very cold to very warm from the poles to the equators. And that gradient drives our weather systems and it drives our ocean currents. 
And the ocean currents drive the upwelling in the oceans, which give us nutrients, which give us fisheries. And the weather, of course, gives us um, all of the rain that we use to grow our crops and also the drier spots where crops don't grow. So our climate and our weather and our ocean circulation is driven by the fact that we have cold poles and a warm equator. So if you imagine a world that didn't have ice at the poles, you'd have a very different world indeed. You'd have much less in the way of atmospheric um, activity. You'd have, we'd have, we'd have larger storms because the temperature is hotter. And in the oceans, you wouldn't have things like the Gulf Stream, which bring warm equatorial waters up to the cold polar regions. So it's, it's a world with less circulation that is a warm world, a pole to pole warm world. Mm -hmm. Great. So for those of us that are just joining us, I just want to remind you that we're here with Dr. Kirk Johnson. We're talking about all things Earth Day, paleontology, earth science. So please, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments on either Facebook and YouTube. And we actually have a few student questions that I would like to ask okay. right now. So um, Josh, the cool kid from YouTube, wants to know how many fossils do you have? <laughs> We, I'm, at the, I'm sitting right now in the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian, where the building I'm sitting in has the world's largest fossil collection. We have over 40 million fossils in this building. It is an amazing collection because that many fossils, basically we have fossils from everywhere in every age, which means that this building is like a gigantic time machine. It's awesome. That's so cool. And uh, Ishan from YouTube wants to know what is the oldest fossil that you found? That I found? Okay, so I went to a place in Australia called Ediacara where the earliest forms of life that you can actually see that are big enough to see that are bigger than bacteria are fossilized. And those fossils are about 570 million years old. So I found 570 million year old fossils, which is pretty old. If you're thinking about that, like, I have such a hard time imagining how long ago 570 million years ago was. You know, if you heard the expression, we're like, oh, this is the span of Earth, you know, about about what are we talking? Where where on the timeline is 570 million years ago? So the Earth is 4.56 billion years old. That's 4,560 million years. It's a huge amount of time. So, but what happened was that there was a long time before we had life forms that we recognized. Anything bigger than a bacteria didn't really start to occur until about a, about a billion years ago. And the first animals are about 600 million years ago. So four fifths of the way through Earth's history it takes us before we start getting our first visible animals. And then slowly they get bigger, then they come on land. We get our first forests about 400 million years ago. We get our first dinosaurs about 230 million years ago. We get our first people, humans, our species, about 300,000 years ago. And we get our first human civilizations about 10,000 years ago. So there's an amazing story, depending on what part of the story you want to think about. But we, we live in a world that has an incredibly cool history. Oh, yeah. And when you think about how, how us as humans have just had a short little, you know, snap a little nothing compared mm -hmm. to the amount of history of our planet. Oh, it's just so cool. I have a couple other questions about our fossils. So um, Alpha GX from YouTube wants to know, if I were to sell these fossils, how much do they cost and how much are they worth? <laughs> well, it, it turns out that their fossils are pretty common, really. I mean, um, there are really rare ones, and there are places you can go where entire mountains are made of fossils. And so there, some people in you know there are types of fossils we use for other purposes, like coal is fossil plant. We use that to make electricity. Oil is fossil plankton. We use that to make gasoline. Limestone is fossil reef dwelling organisms. We use that to make concrete. So in your daily life, you deal with fossil fuels and roads. So you're walking on fossils. You're driving on fossils everywhere. Um, if you wanted to buy like a little fossil snail like this one. Here's a little fossil snail I'm holding in my hand. That little fossil snail is worth about 50 cents. So oh. the common fossils are pretty cheap. You can buy a nice little fossil for a dollar at a gift shop or something like that. I think everybody should have fossils. Fossils are great. Um, but some extremely rare fossils like complete dinosaur skeletons 
are effectively priceless. We have the nation's T-Rex on display here at the museum in Washington, DC, and that's owned by the US government and it's not for sale. It's a priceless rare fossil. So fossils range from things you should have known and are extraordinarily priceless to things you can buy for a dime. If I wanted to find fossils in my backyard or you know, at my local nature preserve or anything like that, how would I go about looking for them? Like, where would I start? Yeah, there's, there's lots of ways to do that. I mean, the first thing to do is to go to a library or look online and read about um, how you would find a fossil. There are a couple of really cool apps. There's an app called Mancos, which shows the geologic map of the world. And you can look at which fossils are found in which places. Um, and you can read uh, books that, about people who have gone, like there are books, uh, like geology roadmap books. Um, I've got a couple of books, one called Cruising the Fossil Freeway and one called Cruising the Fossil Coastline, which talk about how you do find fossils in the American West and the American Far West. Uh, but there's lots of ways to get it and trained by it. There's often fossil clubs, depending on where you live. People go out and collect um, amateur hobbyists who do that. And you can also go to museums in your neighborhood and talk to the museum folks and say, are there places that I can go collect fossils? There are places where it's legal for people to collect fossils. And then sometimes there are places where you have to get permission or it's illegal. So it's important to know who owns the land where you're going because who owns the land owns the fossils. And um, so it's important to know where you are before you start collecting fossils. And if you find something really cool, call a museum. We're always <laughs> curious because it turns out that kids find amazing stuff all the time. And I love it when some kid calls them and says, I think I found a mammoth tooth. And I look at the picture I'm like, yeah, you found a mammoth tooth. So it's possible. And in almost anywhere in this country, it's possible to just bump into a fossil on, the, see a, on a riverbed or a bank or a road cut or an excavation pit, fossils show up in unusual places. So keep your eyes open. If you find something cool, give us a call. That's so cool. Now I'm gonna be on the lookout for a mammoth tooth everywhere I go. <laughs> yeah, it happens. <laughs> we have a couple other questions um, from Facebook. Uh, one is from Cynthia Veramo, who, spoiler alert, that's my mom. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> how, much, how much has Greenland melted? Oh, how much was that? How much has Greenland melted? Oh, it's, it's, it's melting. If you actually, it's one of these very interesting things. Greenland is hard to um, get it level in your head because it's 10,000 feet thick. It, measure, it melts on the order of many, many feet a year, but it's 10,000 feet thick. It's sort of like if you took, uh, you had a bank account with $10,000 in it, you were taking out $20 a year. It's gonna take a long time to deplete that bank account, but it's still a lot of money that you're taking out. So um, it's, if you look at maps of Greenland, sometimes you get confused because they show it's red all across the top of Greenland implying that it's, it's melting away. It is melting fast in the sense that water is pouring off of it, but slow in the sense that it's not gonna melt away for hundreds of years. It won't be gone in 10 years. It's just that the more it melts, the more water flows off of Greenland and into the ocean. And slowly by slowly that will increase the level of the sea, which we don't want because that'll flood the coastlines around the world. And remember, Greenland is only one tenth as large as Antarctica. So if you melted all of Greenland and all of Antarctica, sea level in the world would go up over 200 feet. So are we as worried about Antarctica at this current moment as we are about Greenland? Yeah, we are. We're, Greenland is sort of like a, uh, a test because Greenland is like an example of Antarctica. And if Greenland if all of Greenland melt, there'd still be 90% of the ice in the world left on Antarctica. But um, we're worried about West Antarctica, which is more fragile because there are lots of big ice sheets there. And together, the two of them are the source of our concern about rising sea level over the next century. Because at present rates of melting, we're probably going to see at least three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century and maybe more. And three feet could be enough to do some serious damage to places like Miami, for instance. Yeah, how, how is um, sea level rise? How do we think it's going to impact you know, our daily life? Is it something we're going to see immediately? Or is this something that, you know, we'll just, that will gradually happen over 10, 15, 20 years? Many people are seeing it already. I mean, what happens is that as the sea comes up on stormy days, and when you get, you know, the sea is interesting because uh, a storm can pile water up in what is called storm surges. And so if the sea level is coming up, 
and a storm surge happens, you can get the flooding we had with Katrina down by New Orleans or the flooding we have with Sandy in New York. And even today, on if you have a full moon, which is a high tide full moon situation in places like Miami Beach, um, suddenly the streets will flood. Now the streets weren't flooding in Miami 20 years ago. They're flooding now because the sea level is higher and the water's coming in. So even today, people are being affected by rising sea level. Um, and there are lots and lots of people that live near the ocean around the world. You know, in fact, most of humanity lives not too far from the coastlines because that's where all the fish, the food, the beaches and all that kind of stuff are. So it's gonna be a problem over the next many decades. It will continue to get worse as we continue to warm the planet. Uh, I have a couple more questions from you, from our viewers. Um, we have a lot of questions about our sloth friend. Excellent. Caitlin Bordolani on YouTube um, wants to know, sloths today usually live in rainforests. So was Colorado a rainforest in the past? Oh, you know, there's two answers to that question because Colorado was a rainforest in the past, but when it was a rainforest, it was before the sloths got there. <laughs> so it's What's interesting. Answer. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like a double, it's a double whammy answer. Um, we had rainforests in Colorado between 60 and 55 million years ago. And then Colorado started to get higher in elevation and dry up and cool down. And sloths didn't make it to North America until about 3 million years ago. But the sloths that came across weren't rainforest sloths. They weren't tree sloths. They were ground sloths. And they were desert dwelling sloths. We find their skeletons in places like the Grand Canyon. Um, and they also make it into forests. Uh, some of these big ones, the elephant sized ones, made it all on the Gulf Coast from, to cross Texas into Alabama and Georgia and down into Daytona Beach, Florida. And at a, uh, there's an excavation site in Daytona Beach, Florida that has the remains of several of these gigantic elephant sized sloths. So they weren't rainforest sloths, they were go wherever they wanna go sloths because of the size of elephants. So that's, uh, that kind of leads into another question. Um, Christine Watroba from YouTube wants to know how did the, the giant sloth change into a smaller sloth that we see today? Ah, okay. So the interesting thing is that sloths have been around for a long time. They evolved first in South America and there were sloths for the last 50 years, 60 million years actually. So at its peak in South America, there were literally dozens of different kinds of sloths. There were tree sloths, there were ground sloths. There was even in Peru, an aquatic sloth that swam in the seas. There was a marine sloth. So you have this whole diversity of sloths and all those different kinds of sloths, those all those 40 or 50 kinds of sloths, only four of them walked across the Panama land bridge into North America. And the four were all ground sloths two medium-sized one, one large one, and one huge one. And this one, I, the bone I've got is the large one. This is one that would be bigger than a grizzly bear, but not as big as an elephant. I was going to say, if that was the small one, I would be a little nerve-wracking. Uh, you nasty. should see the skeleton of the big one. It's like 12 feet tall. It's huge. And they then they're still like, you know, furry. They have the claws, like a red yep. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I have a sloth claw. Hold on. Oh. So while Kirk's getting the claw, if you have any other questions, put them in the comments and we'll answer them. Here's a sloth claw. For our, this, is, this is a claw of a, one of these larger sloths, like a, a the grizzly bear sized claw sloth. Wow. And they, these are animals that probably were digging in the ground for roots. They're probably tearing down branches. And if you got too close to them, they'd probably knock you over with the claw. And we think of modern sloths as being very slow. You know, I so said, this is a sloth punching you. It's like super slow motion punch mm -hmm. right across. But the tree sloths today are move slowly because they eat leaves of very slow digestion. And they also hide from their predators by moving very slowly. So the ground sloths probably were um, able to fight back. <laughs> All right, we have a couple other questions. Um, Aaliyah Duncan from Facebook would like to know, how do you keep the equipment working in such extreme conditions? That's a really good question. And in, in the Arctic uh, and the Antarctic, it's really hard to keep your gear together. And in particular, the people that spend the winters in these polar places. Remember, in the Arctic area, in the summer, because the Earth has a tilt, in the summer, you get um, actually 24-hour a day sun. So the Arctic in the summer is not that cold. It might get about freezing, but not much colder. But in the winter, when the tilt of the earth is pointed away from the sun, 
you get 24 hour a day darkness. So not only is it cold, but it's dark, which makes it colder. So you can get temperatures down to minus 75 in the Arctic and over a hundred degrees, minus hundred degrees in the Antarctic. Under those conditions, you really have to be careful with your equipment because stuff freezes up really quickly. And that's one of the biggest dangers down there is your equipment stops working and it's the equipment that keeps you alive. That's a problem. But people have built really good um, technologies and techniques for surviving in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So that's almost like a whole other, when you're thinking about careers, right? So maybe if you're not someone that wants to be in Antarctica or, or you know, going to all these places, there's a whole lot of different roles that have to support all of these scientists that are in the field all of the time, right? So folks working on equipment, logistics, travel, helping plan everything, receiving data on the back end. So like, can you talk a little bit about what a science team like looks like for some of these expeditions? Sure, I mean, you saw us with the helicopters on Greenland and we had, um, of course we had helicopter pilots, we had scientists and their teams, and we had uh, the guy that was putting the GPS in the ice, he was a, um, a basically our safety officer. So he was the guy that had the rifle in case polar bears showed up. He was the guy that was making sure we had the right boots and gear. And he's the person we would put in the dangerous situation because he's a trained mountain climber. So, you know, he's a guy that's sort of our all purpose, keep us safe person. Um, and then we had teams back in the States where, you know, helping us prepare for the trips. We tend to have pretty small crews. And of course there's a film crew there as well, making the film. We had um, two camera people, we had a director and we had a person who did sound and also flew the drones. We fly these little drones with cameras on them and they're like your own personal miniature helicopters. And um, they're really great too, because you can basically fly up with a drone and get a shot that's almost as good as a helicopter shot. That's really cool. Um, all right, we have a couple other questions. Um, a student question from Brown Elementary School on YouTube is, where is the most popular place to find some fossils? Well, there are literally hundreds of places. And if you live um, anywhere you live in the United States, there are good fossils in your neighborhood. You just have to get the books and find out why. And there are different kinds of fossils. And remember, the world changes a lot. And for a long time, all of North America was covered by salt water. So it's very common in places like Illinois and Iowa to find fossil marine organisms. You think, how did they get here? In fact, you even find fossil marine organisms on tops of mountain ranges, which tells you that the mountain ranges have come up since the area was under the ocean. So there's a lot of uh, deduction you can make when you find a fossil because it's telling you a story about the past. A place like Grand Canyon, for instance, where those huge canyon has been cut through almost a mile thickness of layered rocks. Every one of those layers has got fossils in it. And every one of those layers tells you a different story about a different time in Earth's past. So don't think of fossils as just really cool little objects, which they are, but also think of them as little messengers from the past that are telling you stories about our planet. That's great. And Neil Raj from YouTube wants to know, how do you identify the fossils that you find? Uh, well, paleontologists are really good at looking at fragments of things because to become a fossil, something gets buried. I mean, first the animal is living, then the animal dies, the animal gets buried, then it gets buried deeper and deeper. The sediment turns to rock. Sometimes a rock it squishes and breaks and cracks. Then it has to come back up and be eroded and exposed to the surface. So when you find it, the fossil's been through quite a trip already, and it might be broken in little pieces. You might have fragments of things. So you have to get good at recognizing fragments. So imagine this. Imagine if you took a rabbit skeleton, cleaned all off the meat off the rabbit skeleton, all the bones, and then you smash the bones with a hammer, and then you mix them into mud and set the mud hard. Then you chip to the mud and you find a little fragment of a rabbit bone. You say, well, the first question is, is it bone or not? The second question is, what bone in the body is it? And the third question is, whose body was it? So you have to know a lot about the different bones and bodies. You got to know what kind of bones are in rabbits versus the bones on deer and the bones on cougars. And it turns out that paleontologists are really good at looking at fragments of things. If you go looking for fossils with a paleontologist, They'll often bend down and pick up something and go, oh, this is the, the right toe bone of a crocodile. And you're like, how do you know that? 
<laughs> and it's because they know it because they've looked at thousands of right toe bones of crocodiles before. So you have to look at the remains of living things to imagine what the fossil things will look like. And every once in a while you find a fossil that's so perfect, you're like, oh, I know exactly what that is. But that's pretty rare. Usually you find a little chunk of something, you have to figure out what the chunk belonged to. So if you're a paleontologist and you're, or you're interested in getting into paleontology, are there any courses or, you know, things you can watch or consume or hobbies you can be a part of that would kind of prepare you to enter this field? Yeah, there's, there's lots of great things out there now. People, um, people love dinosaurs and they love fossils. So there's a whole lot of stuff on YouTube about fossils. You can look at things like um, Emily Grassley's Brain Scoop at the Field Museum. Lots of museums will have videos about their fossil hunting expeditions. The Denver Museum, our museum here have great things. There are fantastic exhibits. And last June here in Washington, D.C., we opened an amazing exhibit. I'm actually going to show you a yeah, please. here. Um, let me just see if I can get it going. Um, we made an exhibit called Deep Time. And it's an exhibit that takes you through the entire history of life on Earth from the very beginning of the planet all the way to the present, in fact, a little bit into the future. And so if you ever get your chance to go to Washington, D.C., come see this incredible exhibit, Deep Time, which shows dinosaurs, it shows mammals and plants, all sorts of marine organisms, all kinds of things like that. And many museums around the country have similar kinds of exhibits. If you um, go to big cities like Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or Denver or Bozeman or Seattle, or Salt Lake City or Atlanta, there'll be museums that have fossils. That's a great place to see fossils and see reconstructions of what those ancient worlds look like. And then there's tons of books too, really fun books about fossils and lots of great Nova shows and other kinds <laughs> of television shows about fossils. So it's, it's hard not to find cool stuff. Go to bookstores, go to libraries, go to museums. And once you get your nose in fossils, you're gonna have a hard time getting out. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Just from our our comments and questions today. I think we have a lot of budding paleontologists and folks are going to get off our call right now and go in their backyards and start looking for fossils. Start digging. <laughs> start digging. Oh, which is actually um, a question that someone did ask. What tools do you use to look for fossils? Ah, yeah. Do I think, do I have a picture of that? I might even have a picture of that. Let me see. Is, we use some very technical tools to dig fossils. Oh yeah, I do have a picture. I'll share the picture. Um, here we go. You can see that I'm using a very high tech tool called a shovel. We also use pickaxes. We use hammers and brushes and screwdrivers and chisels and pocket knives. We also use other kinds of things, but at the end of the day, fossils are in the ground and the way you find them is you dig them with shovels if the rock is soft and you chip them out with hammers if the rock is hard. And so you can see the guy on the right there has got a pickaxe. That's my favorite kind of tool is a pickaxe, but I'm in the middle, I've got a shovel. I love to dig. So it's pretty simple kind of technology to find a fossil. Um, we also use a lot of glue because when you find a fossil, they're often broken into pieces and the really big ones are shattered so much. So we get to glue them together with very light liquid glue. And then we put a plaster of Paris and burlap jacket on top of it, just like you would put on your leg if you broke your leg. And we use those kinds of things. So in a lot of ways, the tools that paleontologists use for their basic finding of fossils are no different than they were 100 years ago. And the way you find fossils is look for fossils. It's just like fishing. You can't catch a fish if you don't go fishing. You can't find a fossil if you don't go looking for fossils. And usually I can go out without a shovel or anything, just my eyeballs and walk around and I'll look and I'll look and I can usually find fossils with just looking with my eyes. It's just training your eyes to learn to look the right way. That's so cool. It's a place I aspire to be. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that we've all gathered here today is for Earth Day. So we want to, you know, celebrate our planet and, you know, um, talk about some ways that at home, we can protect our planet and, you know, take care of it. Um, so we have a question on Facebook from Karen, who wants to know, do we have enough time to slow the polar ice melt and avoid terrible consequences? Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, I think what we've, what we've learned, and it's all come 
quite recently. I mean, we didn't really understand the impact of burning fossil fuels really until the late 70s, early 80s, which isn't that long ago. I mean, I remember I was in college then. And it has become apparent to us that by our produce, production of carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere, we're warming the climate. So we can reverse that and slow it down by producing less carbon dioxide gas. And in fact, this is an unusual Earth Day because for the global pandemic reasons, we're not flying as much, we're not driving as much, and the skies are getting clearer, the animals are coming out, and we're, em we're actually emitting less carbon dioxide. So this is a very odd year because it's the 50th Earth Day, and we're all gonna talk about what we can do to save the planet. And suddenly we have this other effect, which is the virus gets out and causes the entire globe to stop. And think about the last time the entire globe has stopped doing anything which is pretty much never in human history, <laughs> right. that we've stopped everything at the same time, we're actually seeing a world where we're burning less fossil fuels. And this is the world we need to go into. We need to go into a world where we're actually not emitting carbon dioxide and as a result, not warming the climate. And we've already got enough carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere to start the melting process, but we can stop adding it. We can start removing it by planting trees and other kinds of things to actually start to slow down the warming and maybe even balance the warming. That's the whole Paris Accord was about, was the idea that we have to actually get our carbon budget in control. And we talk a little bit about that in the Nova show, Polar Extremes, we show how much carbon is emitted when you burn a gallon of gasoline, for instance. I mean, think about it, a gallon of gasoline weighs about six and a half pounds. Of that, about five pounds is elemental carbon, but you don't see it when you burn it because it comes out of your tailpipe is carbon dioxide gas, which is a colorless, invisible, odorless gas, which is a greenhouse gas. So that gas comes out of your tailpipe, it contributes um, to the warming of the planet. A gallon of gasoline makes 18 pounds of carbon dioxide gas. Now you can't see it's invisible, but if that carbon came out of solid chunks, you get about a five pound bag of briquettes for a gallon of gas you burn and you'd see the carbon output from your car. So I think it helps people to start personalizing their own carbon footprint, which is how much carbon are you personally generating to the atmosphere? And realize that as humans, we're doing something like 50 billion tons a year collectively, all 8 billion of us. So it's a global challenge and it's a global project, but it's one of the things we have to think about as we go into this next century, as we want to keep the planet from not warming too fast. So we don't want to stress all the ecosystems that depend on the climate that we're living in now, not a warmer climate, not a climate with less um, atmospheric circulation. So it's a big challenge for this generation and I think we can do it, but we've got to start doing it. Great, thank you so much, Kirk. And I think with that, we're gonna wrap our conversation today. So big thank you, Kirk. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and all of our classrooms and everyone from across the country and even the world who joined us today. Um, and a big thank you to everyone for being super engaged in our chats. Um, we saw a lot of great comments, a lot of great questions. So if you're looking for more information about Kirk's journey on polar extremes and about the show, you can watch the entire show on Nova's website, pbs.org slash polar extremes. Um, for our educators out there, we also have an interactive lesson plan, um, an interactive lab called the Polar Lab, which you can find on our PBS Learning Media collection. Um, and continue to, you know, explore, be curious, go outside, look for those fossils. Who knows, maybe you'll find a, a, slow a sloth claw or a little snail or something like that. And that could, you know, inspire our next generation of paleontologists. So um, be well, be safe. Kirk, thank you again for joining us. Yeah, it's my, it's my pleasure. And I will say that we are closed at the museum right now, but we have amazing virtual tours online at our website. If you come, you can literally go to the deep time exhibit and walk through the exhibit on this 3D tour of the exhibit and you can zoom in close enough to read the labels. So it's almost as good as being there. It's not as good as being there, but it's almost <laughs> as good as being there. And we have 15 exhibits on the virtual tour, including one about pandemics and outbreaks. So if you're worried about what's going on right now, check out our Outbreak tour and our Outbreak website as well. So thanks a ton for watching today. Uh, have a fantastic Earth Day. It's an amazing day to think about our planet 
and how cool the planet is and how cool the ancient planets were and how cool our future planet is going to be and do your part to uh, make Earth Day a really successful one. And thanks a ton for watching today. Yeah, thanks, Kirk. And thank you again, everyone else. And you can join us next week at the same time, same place for our final virtual field trip in the series, which is surviving and thriving in a polar desert with Melissa Diaz. So thank you again, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.